All right. So in this segment, we're going to talk about Erickson's psychosocial theory. So it sounds kind of similar to Freud, but now instead of psychosexual, it's psychosocial. Erickson was a follower of Freud. So he had that same basic perspective about the unconscious motives coming from, you know, id based kinds of things. Um, so he had that really overwhelming, you know, belief in, in unconscious motivations. He takes a stage approach just like Freud does. But instead of focusing on, you know, where the psychic energy is placed on what erogenous zone, he talked about social conflicts that are characteristic of each stage of development. Um, so he said from birth to uh, 12 months, instead of being focused on oral stuff, like Freud said, uh, he said that the job of infancy was to develop trust or fall into mistrust for the environment. So that first year of life is babies, you know, really trying to figure out whether they can rely on their environment and their environment largely is their parents at this point. Um, so is the environment trustworthy or not? Now at each of these conflicts there, there's like a positive way to solve it. And that's always going to be on the left. And then there's a negative way to solve it. If the person solves it on the side of the positive, they're going to be better equipped to face the next conflict. If they resolve it on the negative side, that means that they're already starting the next conflict at a deficit and they're going to have a lower probability of, su of successfully navigating that conflict. So the next conflict is toddlerhood and that's going to be from 12 to 24 months. And this is the autonomy versus shame and doubt period. So you'll notice autonomy. They're learning to tie their shoes. They're learning to use the toilet by themselves. They're learning to say no or stop. Um, very similar to some of the things that Freud talked about with regard to personal control. Um, but um, Erickson argues that, you know, on the positive side, you can learn that you are self-controlled and you are an autonomous person, um, or you can end up getting the message that you, your attempts at autonomy are bad, and maybe you shouldn't follow your natural instincts to try and assert yourself and, and like that. So that's the bad side. Um, preschoolers, uh, three to five years of age, it, it's kind of very similar. Now it's about initiative, starting something, you know, um, initiating something. Uh, and will your environment support that initiative? So, you know, if you display a tendency to like to draw, will your environment provide you with the tools that you need to do that? Um, things like that. If not, if your environment makes it, you feel like the things that you want to do are dumb or a waste of money or time or whatever, you can end up feeling guilt. The next major one is the elementary school years and the overarching conflict is to develop a sense of competence. The bad side would be to start to feel inferior to others. During adolescence, this is a hard period of time to define, but basically from puberty, and he said through your 20s, um, the conflict is between identity versus role confusion, trying to figure out who you are versus, you know, sort of um, struggling with that issue, right? Not really knowing what kind of person you are, what kinds of things you like or dislike and so on. Young adulthood, which is from the 20s into the 40s, he said the big challenge is to develop an intimate relationship versus being held in isolation where you don't have a, an intimate bond. Middle adulthood, the big challenge is between generativity where you're sort of leaving a mark on the future versus stagnation where you feel like you're not really, no one's even going to notice if you were gone kind of thing. And then the final stage is late adulthood, 60s and up. Um, and the challenge is between, you know, finishing your life in integrity or finishing it in despair. We're going to talk about um, all of these stages as we go through the different age groups. The thing I want you to notice right now is that, um, notice that this is going all the th way through the lifespan. You know, Freud's theory, once you got to puberty, you were done maturing and he had no more stages for you to go through. With Erickson, he said, no, there are important things that happen after puberty beyond adolescence. And so he's got, you know, things, challenges of adulthood included in his model. All right. So that's an overview. And I went a lot more slowly on, I mean, a lot more quickly on Erickson than I did on Freud in part because um, there's no other place where we'll, we'll really specifically talk about Freudian stages, but you're sort of expected to kind of know that in order to understand other things. And so I wanted to bog down in that for a second. Erickson is explained at every stage. So we'll talk about that in a more, lot more detail in each chapter. All right. So the behavioral learning theories first off there are the conditioning theories now if you've never had psych 100 which i know probably a lot of you have had psych 100 or if you took psych 100 from someone who doesn't like to teach the learning theories anymore let me review <laughs> um, conditioning is a word that means like training um, so you've got 
some kind of environmental stimulus informing your future behaviors is basically what conditioning theories say. There are two main kinds of conditioning theory. One is classical conditioning. Here's a cartoon about it. Psychology, you know, I once attempted Pavlovian conditioning for sex on a girlfriend. And his friend goes, how? He goes, well, I would play the same song every time we hooked up, thinking I could use it to turn her on whenever I wanted. And the friend goes, hmm, what happened? Well, the song came on at the gym once and I've been banned from aerobics for life. Classical conditioning, the idea is that you're going to pair something out in the environment with something else out in the environment. So, um, so this little cartoon is kind of leaving a little bit of detail out in the classical conditioning model. But if you recall back to Pavlov's dogs, right? Um, so we have these dogs who are being studied for saliva. Um, it's a big elaborate study. They're wanting to collect their saliva for, for research. So they've got these dogs in their kennels and, and they've got these, sal these tubes in their salivary glands collecting saliva. And whenever the helper comes in to feed the dogs, uh, a buzzer goes off to give them access to the kennel area. So the door buzzes and then here shortly thereafter the, the food is presented. So what Pavlov accidentally noticed is that after a couple of days of living like this, when the dogs heard the buzzer, they'd start salivating in advance. No longer were they only salivating while they were eating, they were salivating in advance. They start, started to pair the buzzer with the presentation of the food. So we've got these two things out in the environment being paired together. And now no longer do I have to wait for the food to be presented. I know that buzzer means it's about to pre be presented and I start getting excited. In this case, I salivate. Um, so classical conditioning is the pairing of two stimuli out in the environment so that a previously meaningless stimulus suddenly becomes meaningful. And I start reacting as if it is the meaningful stimulus. That's different from operant conditioning. Operant conditioning is where we're going to behave in some way and then we get some kind of feedback about that behavior and that feedback determines whether we do the behaviors again in the future or not. Um, so operant conditioning is us learning from the consequences of our behaviors. So one way to get a behavior to be repeated in the future is to reinforce that behavior. Now there's positive reinforcement where we um, add something desirable. So let's say that we're working with children. And so, you know, when they do what we want, we give them a gummy bear. So you get one, one gummy bear for doing what I want. Um, that would be what we call positive reinforcement. We're giving them something that they want. Negative reinforcement is still a, a, an outcome that's going to be encouraging the behavior. A lot of times I hear people saying negative reinforcement when they mean punishment. Negative reinforcement has the word reinforcement in there. It is not punishment. It's an encouragement to do the behavior again. Um, so in negative reinforcement, we're going to take away something that is undesirable. So for example, if you do what I want, I won't make you do your chores today, right? So if you do what I want, I'll take away something that you don't like. So you'll notice I made the positive a plus sign and the negative a subtraction sign because that's what Skinner meant when he called them positive and negative. He didn't mean it good and bad. I think that's the problem is that a lot of people think positive means good and negative means bad. Um, so if you in your mind just sort of substitute add, so instead of saying positive reinforcement, say add reinforcement versus subtract reinforcement, it kind of makes a little bit more sense. It doesn't roll off your tongue very easily. But um, positive means to add and negative means to subtract. It does not mean good and bad. So if you can kind of erase that good and bad, that judgment component and think positive is adding something that the, that the learner wants, negative is subtracting something they don't want. And all of this is to reinforce them. So now in the future, because they got that gummy bear, they want to do the behavior again. Or because doing that behavior got them out of their chores, they're likely to do the behavior again because they don't want to do their chores. Then there's punishment. A lot of times people don't like the word punishment because in their minds, they immediately go to like spanking or something corporal punishment. Um, punishment does not have to have any component of physicality to it at all as far as that. Um, positive punishment is where you're going to add something undesirable. So I'm going to make you do chores because of your behavior. I don't want to see this behavior again in the future. So I'm going to add something that you don't like. So because you guys um, left this mess in here, you don't get to go to the movies with your friends. You have to clean the room up. Um, I'm adding something undesirable. 
negative punishment is where we're going to subtract something desirable. So um, I was going to give you gummy bears for your good behavior, but because you, you know, did something I don't want to see again, you don't get your normally planned gummy bears. You know, the thing that you were expecting and that you thought always came, you're not getting because you did something I didn't want. I don't want to see that behavior again. So I'm going to take away something desirable. Um, a lot of parents use negative punishment where they say, okay, no Xbox time or, you know, no, I'm taking away your phone or, you know, whatever power the parent has. Um, they take away something that the child really likes and it in the hopes that it will reduce the likelihood of the, of the behavior in the future. That's the key to punishment. We're trying to make the behavior go away by implementing punishment. With reinforcement, we're trying to make the behavior happen again. I'll just say one thing about parenting that will, or, or dog ownership, for those of you who have dogs, um, cats as well, even horses, if you have a horse, these things work really well. <clears throat> you, can re you can figure out what the learner likes, and then you can use that as a reinforcement when, when you want that behavior to continue. You can figure out what that learner doesn't like, and you can use it as a reinforcement. You can say, okay, you won't have to do that thing if you do what I'm asking you to do. <clears throat> or I can add it in. You've done what I don't like, so now I'm going to add in this undesirable thing, right? Or, well, you did something I don't like, now you don't get to have the thing you do like, right? Like you can use this very effectively on your learner. The key thing is that you have to figure out what the learner wants and what the learner doesn't want. It can't just be something that you would assume they shouldn't like, because that can cause you to actually do something that's reinforcing to them when you're trying to punish them. Or you can't give them something that you assume they should like. Like I like black licorice. So if I want to encourage your behavior, I'm going to give you black licorice as a reward. Well, for my, what seems to be every single person I ever meet, that's not going to actually be a reward. That's going to be a punishment. For those of you who like black licorice, right on, man, right? Um, but for those of you who don't, you're thinking, why would you give me black licorice? This is so punishing, right? So it has to be something that for the learner is a reinforcer. And for the learner is something that's punishing. So um, for my daughter, for example, um, if she behaved badly, I would take away her whatever book she was currently reading. <laughs> I would deprive her of her book. That would not work on my son who didn't like to read. Um, you, have to, you have to hit them where it hurts when you're trying to punish them, right? So you have to find something that they don't want to have happen um, when you want to reward them. So when it was time to reward my daughter, hey, let's go to the library. <laughs> <laughs> for my son, that was punishment. Um, so you have to figure out for your learner what's going to work. And that's how operant conditioning is effective. Now you want to focus on mainly reinforcements if your goal is to shape their behavior. You want to have, according to Skinner, 10 reinforcements for every one punishment. Because reinforcement is much more informative, he says. And learners learn more from reinforcers than they do from punishments. So he doesn't say punishment is inherently bad or will, will harm self-esteem or anything like that. Because as a behaviorist, he's not worried about something as mental as self-esteem. He's just saying objectively, re reinforcement works better at shaping a behavior than punishment does. So you should use punishment very sparingly and focus instead on finding the learner doing something that you like and reinforce that behavior. All right, social learning theory is our, la our last category. Oh, I just got a notification that startled me. I apologize for that. Um, social learning theory says that we learn a lot of our behaviors through modeling. And here we have a perfect picture of modeling going on. Um, and so this is gonna be an important theory throughout class. The idea that the way that people in the environment behave, particularly um, parents, but also older siblings or peers, are going to serve as information about desirable behaviors for the learner. All right, let's go ahead and stop here. And in the next segment, we'll talk about Piaget's cognitive developmental theory. <laughs>